Uh, Father, as we get into the Word, we just want to thank you um, just for that sweet and tender time of worship, Lord God. Uh, we, we declare, Lord God, we proclaim, we say, Lord God, that we are lost, we are desperate without you. We, we don't ever want to take your presence for granted, Lord God. We don't ever want to just get familiar with your presence. We thank you, Lord, that every time we gather, your word says, Lord, where two or more are gathered in your name, you are there. And I pray, Lord God, that it would always be in your name that we gather, because then we know that you are present, Lord God. Thank you that a moment in your presence, Lord God, is, is life-changing. A moment in your presence, the psalmist cries out, is better than a thousand, a thousand elsewhere. And, and we, we just proclaim that. We declare that tonight, Lord God. And as we dive into the word together this evening, Lord God, just for these next few moments, I pray, Lord God, that your, your presence, your word, your, 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 your very spirit, Lord God, would, would just minister deeply and profoundly to us, Lord God. Um, may, may we have ears to hear. May we have hearts to receive what it is you want to say, what it is you want to do in us and through us today. We pray, Lord God, as that word that Sheetal brought, Lord God, we, we thank you that you are here. We thank you that you are speaking. And I pray, Lord, that we would be a people that would respond. What are you wanting me to do, Lord Jesus? How are you calling me? Are you asking me to step out of the boat? I pray, Lord God, tonight would be that night where lives are changed and transformed because we have encountered the living God. Oh, Lord God, may you be blessed through the preaching of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? This is the question that Isaiah starts off what we know to be chapter 53 of his book of, uh, his book of prophecy. It's this very chapter, Isaiah chapter 53, is a, is a window into the very heart, into the very center of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. If, if you take Isaiah chapter 53 out of the Bible, it's not that we have a different version of Christianity. We literally do not have Christianity at all. This weekend, over 2.4 billion people who are followers of Jesus around the world are going to be celebrating, looking back on and celebrating and rejoicing and reflecting on the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And that's literally what Isaiah is doing. The remarkable thing, though, is he's doing it 700 years before the event actually happened. 700 years before Jesus died on the cross as a substitute for the sin sins of the world. 700 years before Jesus rose from the dead, and in doing that, defeated Satan, and defeated sickness, and defeated anything that would separate us from the presence of God. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you're part of this church, you'll know that I repeat it and say it often. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, God made him who had no sin, Jesus who had no sin, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become, we might be the righteousness of God. Jesus took our sin on himself. And in exchange for that, he gave us his life. He gave us the fullness of life. He gave us life as it was meant to be lived. That's the arm of the Lord that Isaiah is referring to. That's the strength of God. That's the might of God. That's the saving and rescuing power of the Lord. And it's been revealed. The question that Isaiah asks, the question that I want to ask you is, have we believed it? Have we believed the gospel? Have you believed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isaiah continues in verse 2. He says, he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. What, what is so glorious, what is so surprising, what is so shocking about the gospel is that we experience life. Our life came from Jesus' death. 
Our victory came from Jesus' defeat. Our freedom came from the fact that Jesus had to suffer and that he had to sacrifice his life. And, and in these opening verses of Isaiah 53, what Isaiah wants us to grasp, what I hope that we can grasp firstly tonight, is the surprise of the cross. How shocking the news is, the good news, how, how counterintuitive the news of the cross is. We need to acknowledge that before we go any further. He continues in verse 4. He says, surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. If, if Isaiah 53 is, is a window into the very kind of core of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, if, if, if Isaiah 53 is, a, is the crux to the gospel, then, then verse 5 has to be probably the most important verse in all of Scripture, not just this particular chapter. It describes what Jesus went through and what Jesus suffered on our behalf. Look at verse 5. He was, he was pierced for us. He was crushed for us. He was punished for us. He was wounded for us. The Gospels tell us that Jesus was stripped naked, that Jesus was mocked, that Jesus was ridiculed, that Jesus was flogged, and a crown of thorns was placed upon his head, that, that nails were driven into his wrists and, and into his ankles, and a lance pierced Jesus' side. And, and we might ask the question, why must Jesus go through such a violent and shameful death? And, and I would put it to you that Jesus' death on the cross was, was so violent and so shameful because God in Jesus was stepping into our collective shoes and, and paying the price for every unhelpful, every hurtful, every shameful, every violent, every unthinkable evil act ever committed anywhere across all time. And that's why, secondly, Isaiah wants us to grasp not just the, the surprise of the cross, but secondly, the substitution that's taking place at the cross, that Jesus died in our place. He, he wants us to consider the fact that Jesus paid for our sin, and, and with that comes peace and life and healing and wholeness. And, and in the light of that reality, a question that I often find myself asking is, is this, why do I settle for less than what Jesus' suffering and ultimate death paid for? It's a question we need to ask ourselves, friends. If Jesus went through all of this to not only pay for our sin, but, but that we are healed in Jesus' name, why do we settle for less than what Jesus paid for. Jesus paid for every sin. So why do I struggle to forgive myself or to forgive others when God already has? Jesus promised healing. Jesus promised wholeness. So do I contend for that? Or do I just settle and be content with the, with the, with the status quo? These are important questions that we ask ourselves. The day that Jesus was sentenced to death and executed, there was one person in particular on that day who experienced the reality, the life-transforming reality of substitution more powerfully and more directly than anyone else, and that person's name was Barabbas. Barabbas' name means son of the father. That's exactly who Jesus is. And Barabbas was arrested for, for insurrection. That's the very thing that Jesus was accused of. Now, at Passover, it was Jewish custom for one criminal, one person who had been arrested to be liberated, and the crowd had chosen Barabbas over Jesus. And so on the day of, of his scheduled execution, a jailer would have walked to Barabbas' jail cell and opened the, 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 the cell doors, and instead of saying, it's time to die, would have said to Barabbas instead, you are free to go. 
Someone else, this, this man called Jesus, will be executed in your place. When I think about that, I, I wonder whether Barabbas would have stayed on to have a look and see who this person was that paid the price for his liberation, who this Jesus was. And I, I suspect he did. And if, if Barabbas did inste- in, indeed stay on, I'm pretty sure that every time Jesus was flogged, Every time Jesus was spat at, every time Jesus was ridiculed and scorned, every time a hammer blow drove the nail deeper into his wrists, into Jesus' wrists and into Jesus' ankles, Barabbas must have thought, that should have been me. That should have been us. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. The substitution of the cross is reinforced by the words spoken by Jesus on the cross. Father, Jesus cries out. It's a remarkable thing to say. Despite the pain, despite the anguish, despite the humiliation, Despite the, 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 the suffering, Jesus had willingly surrendered to his Father's will being done, not his own. What an incredible example for us, friends, to trust our Heavenly Father enough that we would say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Father, he says from the cross, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. In his letter to the church in Rome, Paul writes, Paul teaches the church that Jesus is interceding for every one of his followers right now in heaven. And that's true, friends. Right now, Jesus is interceding for us right now. But Paul doesn't tell us what Jesus is praying for. I wonder whether it's this. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And then Jesus, while he's hanging on the cross, he turns to the thief that is next to him. And he responds to the thief's request, the thief's question. The question, will you remember me? He responds to the thief's uh, faith with a remarkable promise. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. I I wonder if there's ever been a clearer or more simple presentation of the gospel that has come out of Jesus' mouth. You here tonight, friends, if you are not a follower of Jesus and you simply look to him and say, Jesus, remember me. The promise is today you will be with him. Today you will be with him. And as as he's hanging on the cross, Jesus turns to his mother and he says, dear woman, here is your son. And he says to John, and here is your mother. It's this beautiful picture of the reward and the responsibility of family that we enjoy in Jesus. Friends, when we follow Jesus, we become part of a community of brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers, a community that we are to invest in and serve and guard and build up and strengthen. Jesus was crucified at the third hour. That's nine o'clock in the morning. But at noon, at the sixth hour, we are told that darkness covered the land until three in the afternoon, and Jesus was silent. You see, in the midst of all of these words that were spoken by Jesus at the cross, we mustn't overlook the silence of the cross. Isaiah picks up on this in verse 7. He says, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He, He remained silent He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. There are times when it is appropriate to, to sit in the stillness and the silence of not having all the answers, of not having an explanation for everything. And I want to say, friends, over this weekend, it's not inappropriate to sit in the stillness and 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 experience the, the silence of the cross. And in fact, right now, I'm going to ask us, and this might feel very awkward for some, but can we just take a moment to do that, just just to close our eyes for a moment, and and not to get introspective in any way, but for us to, to, to look to the cross and acknowledge that the cross is empty. All that Jesus went through. 
the suffering that he experienced was to purchase salvation for every person who walks on this planet. But not just salvation, friends, healing and wholeness. Father, I pray, I pray for myself as much as I pray for everyone here. As we just sit in, in, in this moment and, and consider the, the silence of the cross, not, not having answers to every question we have, but knowing, Jesus, that you, ro- you were raised from the dead, defeating sin, sickness, and separation from the Father. Lord, let faith arise in our hearts. Let faith arise in our hearts. After three hours of darkness, after three hours of silence, Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We will never know the pain and the torment that Jesus went through. But one thing we know, by by quoting the first verse of Psalm 22, what Jesus is doing in the midst of that pain and torment is he's reaching into the, the truth of Scripture. And he's looking to Scripture to give him hope and, 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 and a sense of victory in the face of defeat and assurance in the face of abandonment. And then Jesus says, I am thirsty. And as he says those words, he becomes the sponge that soaks up all the sin and filth and sickness of the human race so that we wouldn't have to thirst. So that we can go to Jesus and we can, and we can come to him and we can drink. And the promise is that out of us will flow rivers of living water. And then finally Jesus says, it is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus was not killed. No one killed Jesus. Jesus willingly gave up his life. Jesus willingly laid down his life so that by faith in him, we might live and live for eternity. Friends, tonight we have been challenged and hopefully uh, exhorted to consider the surprise of the cross and the substitution of the cross. We've, we've given thought to the words spoken by Jesus on the cross and, and the reality of the silence at the cross. And we point people to the cross and we, we celebrate Jesus because of his death on the cross. But we are not Friday people. Sunday is coming. Silence turns to exuberant praise as we celebrate not just Jesus' death, but we also celebrate the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. We cannot Forget the spoils of the cross. And this is how Isaiah puts it right at the end of chapter 53. Through what he experienced, my righteous one, my servant, will make many righteous ones as he himself carries the burden of their sins. We are no longer a people defined by what we didn't do. No longer defined by things that we should have done or couldn't have done in our own strength, but we are defined by what Jesus did on our behalf. I wonder if the worship team wouldn't mind coming up. We're going to go back into a time of worship in a moment and and break bread together. But but as we do that, I want to just return to verse 1 and the question that Isaiah asks. Remember this. He says, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. I ask you tonight, friends, have you believed the gospel message? How will you respond to the saving strength and the rescuing power of the Lord? Will you be like the thief on the cross who, who in, his, in the depths of his own despair, in the depths of his own suffering and weakness, saw how far Jesus was willing to go in order to rescue him from that? After all, the thief was guilty He realized Jesus was innocent. Will you be like the thief on the cross and receive Jesus as your savior? Or will you be like the Ethiopian eunuch that that if we had time, we would turn to in in Acts chapter eight and read that that while he was was riding in his chariot, he literally turned to the text that we have just unpacked, Isaiah 53. And when he read that and realized that, that Jesus was given as a sacrifice to save his sins, He cried out. He said, what is stopping me from being baptized? It was was not just a, a declaration of Jesus as Savior, 
but a surrender to Jesus as Lord. So my challenge to you tonight, friends, is not will you receive only Jesus as your Savior, but will you surrender to Him as Lord? Or will we respond like Matthew and the other disciples who, who walked with Jesus three years on this, on this earth and, and watched Him minister and realized that Jesus didn't only come to save sinners from sin, but Jesus came to heal people of sickness and disease. That Jesus came to set the oppressed free by declaring the truth and reality of the authority of his name. And Matthew and the disciples must have realized that Isaiah 53 wasn't just a declaration of salvation, but it was a promise of healing and a promise of deliverance as well. Like them, like the disciples, will we take hold of everything that Jesus has won for us on the cross? Or will we be like Caiaphas, the high priest, who despite seeing Jesus' disfigured body on the cross, despite knowing that Jesus was innocent, despite knowing that the tomb was empty after three days, still failed to see the Messiah in Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Is that you? I ask you tonight, before we go any further, have you responded to the gospel? Have you responded to the Messiah of Isaiah 53? The one who paid the price for not just for the sins of mankind, but for your sin, past, present, and future. He paid for it freely. You don't earn it. He paid for it fully, and he paid for it forever. The response that we are invited to is to come empty-handed and to receive this incredible gift of new life that Jesus promises. I would be so privileged to lead you in that prayer tonight where you would simply say, Jesus, I, I don't understand it all, but, but would you come into my heart? I, I, I believe that you are who you say you are. And I believe that you have done on the cross what you say, what the word of God says you have done. I have, I have tried to find meaning and fulfillment in my own strength. Jesus, tonight, I surrender. I give up trying. I give up earning, trying to earn things, earn your favor. And I realize that it comes free of charge, simply by faith in you. If that's you tonight, if you're saying, that's, that's me, would you pray for me, Steve? Okay, could I ask you just to real quick, lift up your hand. I'd love to, to lead you in a prayer this, this evening. Does anyone want to respond to the gospel tonight? To receive Jesus into their hearts as Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you. We thank you so much for, for the reality of what has taken place on the cross. The remarkable gift of salvation that is found in and through Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Jesus, we are eternally grateful for all that you have done for us. And as, Lord, as we, as we kind of transition into this moment where, where we're gonna break bread together, I pray, Lord God, that, that, that we would just take this time to, to not just reflect on the cross, but also reflect on the reality that you have been raised from the dead from the cross and that you are now seated in glory at the Father's right hand. What a privilege it is to celebrate the gospel in this way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to break bread.